Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Kiwi Astronomers. I'm Gareth Davies, and I'm talking to you from Auckland in New Zealand. And we are very pleased to have with us this evening, once again, Professor John Hernshaw, who's talking to us from Canterbury. John, how are you? I'm very well, Gareth. How's things in Auckland? Things in Auckland? Always great in Auckland, isn't it? I mean, the, very difficult um, to think of anything negative to say, so all I can say COVID is... COVID capital of New Zealand. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for those kind words. Now, uh, John has very kindly agreed to, to join us. Um, that's the Kiwi Astronomers again this evening. And John, um, for those of you who haven't um, heard him speak before, is was or is the Emeritus Professor of Astronomy and was previously the Professor of Astronomy at Canterbury University and one of um, their brightest stars uh, emanating from that university was a woman called uh, Beatrice Hill. So she married a gentleman called Tinsley and so she's Beatrice Hill Tinsley and she is, was, sadly she passed away. Uh, she was a wonderful astronomer and John is going to tell us about her. And this is something that um, all New Zealanders who are interested in astronomy should know, and anybody who's interested in astronomy should know. So John, please tell us yes, all about So uh, Beatrice is one of New Zealand's uh, most famous and celebrated astronomers. She uh, was an undergraduate at the University of Canterbury, did a master's degree at Canterbury in physics, not astronomy. and. Then she married her sweetheart, Brian Tinsley, um, just at the time they uh, both were finishing up as graduate students. And Brian had a job in uh, Dallas and Texas. So off they went as a married couple. And Beatrice aspired to do a PhD in astronomy. She had become interested in astronomy, but she found the conditions in Dallas for um, doctoral study were not ideal for a woman. So eventually she enrolled at the University of Tex Texas in Austin. That was quite a long way from Dallas. So she had to commute to Austin to do her PhD, which she did, by the way, in record time. It was a theoretical study of galaxies and their evolution. So she wrote a brilliant PhD thesis, thesis and impressed a lot of people, but uh, angered one of America's uh, most illustrious um, astronomers, Alan Sandage. So they did battle over the results that Beatrice um, set out in her thesis. Really? So shall I, shall I go on? Yes, really. I, I'm, I'm shocked that, um, that anybody should... Um... Why did he? Why was he battling her? Was it because she was a woman? <laughs> well, you might say that, but uh, Sandage, I think, had particular ideas on uh, how galaxies evolved, and he, um, and but Beatrice um, predicted that they evolved much more rapidly than anyone expected, and the brightness of galaxies therefore changed. And therefore, it was much harder to use galaxies as standard candles to estimate their distance based on their brightness because the age of the galaxy was also a factor. So um, what was it that really made her stand out? She um, was had a brilliant analytical mind. She was not really... A, um, Theoretical. Well, she was a theoretical astronomer. She was certainly not an observational astronomer, but she collected little snippets of information from other people and put all this information together from observers into a melting pot, analyzed it using the best theories and came up with results. So it was just an incredible mind for absorbing information from a wide number of different people. So she, her mind worked at twice the speed of most um, normal people. And um, 
This was very evident when she was giving seminars because she spoke twice as fast as anyone else could and got through twice as much information in a one hour seminar. Did you, did you ever hear her speak? Oh yes. So um, I, after I finished my PhD, I, um, I had a, um, a research fellowship, first of all in Paris for a few years. And Beatrice actually came to the Paris Observatory, but I was away observing and I missed meeting her then. Oh no. But I, I heard all about it. But then I had um, a second fellowship at Harvard um, University and Smithsonian Institution in Cambridge Math. And Beatrice by that stage was at Yale University, not so far away. And she gave to give a seminar. She gave a seminar at Harvard. And I heard that one and she was amazing. She was talking about which stars become supernovae. These are stars which explode at the end of their lives. So um, she actually, uh, when she visited Harvard, she had heard there was a Kiwi astronomer um, um, at the um, Harvard Smithsonian Observ Center for Astrophysics, it's called. So she knocked on my door and came to see me and I had a very nice chat with Beatrice and um, it was great to get to know her. And um, she wanted to find out what I was doing. In fact, as I said, she collected little bits of information from observers. While I was observing um, solar type stars, measuring their composition and stars of different age. So it's very relevant to the chemical evolution of our Milky Way galaxy. So she wanted to know about the the data I had obtained about the chemical composition of stars of different age. What, and was, she, what was she? What was she like? Was she? Was she a nice person? Was she sort of? But I mean, what was she sort of obsessed with? 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 with or did she, was she a bane? Did she ask how was life back? Or what was you know New Zealand she, like these days? Well, she. We did talk about New Zealand. She said, "Well." Um, New Zealand is a very nice place and she was obviously very grateful to have grown up there and but she said she could never work in an environment like New Zealand because <laughs> she was interacting with so many people all the time on a daily basis so it was interactions with other people getting little bits of information and of course New Zealand a country with the most 12 astronomers and and the United States with probably about 6,000, you can see that the environment here <laughs> would not suit Beatrice, would not have suited her at all. Oh, oh dear, that's, maybe if you'd come to Auckland, she'd have felt differently, but there you go. <laughs> anyway, she, she uh, chose to be in the United States simply because she interacted with a lot of astronomers, but she had a very tough time. Um, she was, I think, treated quite badly as a woman and female astronomers were not widely accepted anywhere. Uh, this was um, in the, um, she did her PhD in, um, oh, in the 60s. So I, I was at Harvard in the mid seventies. So by that stage she become in her thirties a, a full professor at Yale University. Wow. So, um, she was uh, extremely interesting to talk to, um, very engaging, very warm-hearted, oh, and yeah, fantastic person. Yeah. So um, I enjoy, enjoyed very much uh, meeting Beatrice, but very sadly, um, she died very soon after that encounter. Um, she died in 1981 at the age of 40. From melanoma. Yes. I saw a play um, about her called Bright Star. I saw that play too. In fact, I went to Circa in Wellington and saw that play. I've just forgotten who the playwright was, but um, the people at Circa asked me to give a little talk after the play, after the opening night. Wow, um, that's great. About Beatrice. Simply, I think probably. Um, Beatrice's sister Theodora was in the audience, so perhaps that was the link. So I did that and just a sort of 10 minutes um, talk, more or less along the lines of our talk here now. Right. So I chatted about um, Beatrice and how I'd met her um, a few years earlier. 
and um, that was good fun. Oh, that's rather nice. Yes, um, in the in the play, she it was quite clear she was very badly treated by her husband's colleagues, and she yes, had, absolutely, yes, and she couldn't get on in the department, and he was getting promotion, and she wasn't being recognised, but she was just seen as the wife who should stay yeah, she, and dish out cocktails. The thing about Beatrice's life is she had to make a choice in accepting a professorship at Yale between family and career. And she had adopted two children in the United States. She um, really chose career over family. So she left the kids in Texas with um, Brian Tinsley and um, went off to Connecticut. Ah. So that was a, a, a very hard choice for her, but that's what she did. For sure. And um, you, of course, are the chairperson of the Royal Astronomical Society of New Zealand's Lecture Tr Trust, which every year awards uh, Beatrice Hill Tins Tinsley Lecture. Oh, so I've had a three year stint, but with COVID, um, we haven't appointed so many um, Beatrice Hill Tinsley lecturers because they haven't been able to come to New Zealand to do a lecture tour of the country. So um, it's more or less a non-event, but hopefully early next year there will be one. But there are a lot of, um, <clears throat> I understand, awards and, and, and medals handed out now in recognition of the work that she did. It, oh, it, yes. It, so Bet Beatrice certainly has been, I think, well recognised. In fact, the University of Canterbury has the Tinsley Building, which opened in a couple of years ago. There is a mountain in Fiordland named uh, Mount Tinsley. There is uh, a prize offered by the New Zealand Association of Scientists, the Tinsley Prize. And there is an asteroid named Tinsley. Um, what else? Um, that's it. And there's a very good um, biography about Beatrice. John, also a bright star. If you were to put into one sentence, so I'll let you have two, what it was that she is best known for in one or two sentences, could you tell us? Well, the area of her research was galaxy evolution. Her reputation is based on an incredible inquiring mind which encompassed a very large number of sources about um, galaxies. So she could absorb information and put it all together into an amazing synthesis in a way very, very few people have been able to do. So it was just intellectual curios curiosity. So there that you was go. Quite outstanding. There you go, everyone. That's Beatrice Hill Tinsley. And but a, a nice segue now to the next topic that I wanted to talk to John about. Um, John, um, as we said, is the chair of Razan's Lecture Trust with the Beatrice, Beatrice Hill Tinsley lectureship, lectureship. And they brought out a number of years ago um, an, uh, another astronomer from the US called Natalie Battaglia. And as it happens, I was listening to um, a, a podcast the other day uh, with Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, uh, in which she was interviewed and Natalia actually has a role with the James Webb Space Telescope and that's the segue because what I wanted to do with the James Webb Telescope going up very soon I wanted to get John's hopes and aspirations for that telescope John. A lot of people are saying that the James Webb Space Telescope is the successor of Hubble. Hubble, by the way, is still working, but right at the end of its life, it's been up there um, 30 years now. So um, the James Webb Space Telescope is much bigger than Hubble, much more expensive than Hubble. And some people say it's the most complicated and expensive uh, astronomy space project ever conceived. I'm sure that's probably right. 
So it's going to be launched in a few days, actually, on Christmas Eve in, um, in the United States. Actually, it's going to be launched from French Guyana, from the um, European spaceport there. And when it's launched will be actually Christmas Day for New Zealanders, about one o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day. And what are your hopes for that telescope? What do you think? There's so many things said about it. What do you think it'll bring? Well, first of all, uh, my hope is that it works because it's incredibly complicated. It's such a big telescope. It doesn't fit inside a space rocket unless it's folded up. So they folded the whole telescope up, including the mirror, and it has to be released into space and then unfold with into to give a reflecting mirror which is incredibly precise in its surface over an aperture of six and a half meters. So comparing Webb with Hubble, Hubble is 2.4 meters, the diameter of the primary mirror. The Webb Space Telescope has a, um, a composite mirror with hexagons, 18 hexagons, but overall it's six and a half meters in diameter. So the first hope is that that mirror can unfold itself and um, the telescope can work. And that, <laughs> it's so complicated. I don't think it's anything as certain, but it costs 10 billion US dollars, so it better work. As for the science it's going to do, I think there are, I'm told there are two main projects. One is looking at the very earliest stars which form um, soon after the Big Bang. So looking at great distances in space and therefore back a great deal of time to eras shortly after the Big Bang, sort of thir um, 13 and a half um, billion years ago. So uh, seeing how the universe started, how the first stars and first galaxies formed in that um, very early era of cosmic evolution. That's the first thing. And it's look, looking in the infrared because the ultraviolet radiation from those first stars has been greatly stretched by the expansion of the universe, the expansion of space time. So the radiation which left those stars as short wavelength ultraviolet radiation is now in the mid infrared. So, so that's where the Webb Space Telescope, the James Webb will be looking. That's one major project. So it's understanding cosmology better from the data they get. The other one is looking at extrasolar planets or usually called exoplanets these days. And a big question for exoplanets is are the planets which um, might harbor life, which are in principle habitable, the right temperature? And is there any chance of detecting life on other planets? Well, if planets have an atmosphere, and if, if there is a biosignature in the atmosphere, um, and well, the sort of gases in the atmosphere which are conducive to supporting life, then there's a possibility that James Webb Telescope can detect using spectroscopy these, um, the chemical composition of planetary exoplanet atmospheres. And it will do that by if a, a planet transits in front of its parent star, the planet itself is giving a negligible amount of light, but the stellar radiation from the star can pass through the atmosphere on its way to the Earth, and therefore some of that light will be absorbed by molecules in the planetary atmosphere. And that's wow. how, but of course, only a very tiny fraction of the starlight will be so absorbed. So these absorption signatures are incredibly faint. People have tried doing this technique, but we know it's incredibly difficult because the absorption features 
are extremely weak. So you need uh, to collect a lot of light and get very good quality spectra. So James Webb hopefully can do this. And if it's successful, we might find out which of the thousands of exoplanets we now know exist, thanks in part from the Kepler Space Telescope, which has now finished its work. And um, using the data from Kepler, looking at those um, stars we know have planets and observing them again with the Webb Telescope, we might be able to prove that some of these planets are possible places where life might exist. So I think oh. that's the other major project for the James Webb is exoplanets. Okay, so everybody, Christmas Day, fingers crossed. Yeah. I think NASA is going to um, record the launch live and the rocket should take off from French Guiana. I think it's 1.20 in the morning on Christmas Day. That's New Zealand time. New Zealand time, yes. Wow, 1.20 a.m. Christmas morning. But of course, you, you, you don't really want to ruin your Christmas day by getting up after midnight to watch the launch, do you? Oh, I shall. I think I, I definitely it, shall. It'll be on the news um, later on on Christmas day. I might not get up to watch the All Blacks, but I'll certainly get up to watch the James Webb. <laughs> Is that right? Are the All Blacks, they would... All Blacks aren't playing on Christmas Day, are they? <laughs> no, <laughs> they aren't. <laughs> hey, thanks, John, on that one. We're all going to watch with bated breath. Um, and there's another nice segue out of this. So as we come from um, Beatrice Hill through Natalie Battaglia, uh, I want to talk to you about somebody else that you met. Um, somebody who also had a brilliant PhD thesis. Somebody else who was a woman, somebody else who was a professor at a prestigious university on the East Coast of the United States of America. And that of course would be John. I think you must be talking about Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin. Absolutely right. Yes, you've got a fascination Hello. Gareth with female astronomers, have you? <laughs> Well, I'm I'm married to one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so you are. What a silly question. <laughs> yeah, I did beat, uh, as I mentioned, I, <clears throat> I did a postdoctoral research fellowship at Harvard Smithsonian in the mid-70s, and Cecilia Payne-Gaposchkin was at the end of her career at that stage. She was in her mid-70s, so she was the age I am now, um, some, what, 50 years, not quite 50 years ago. So uh, she had a towering reputation. Cecilia was born in England and she studied at Cambridge and perhaps a bit like uh, Beatrice Tinsley, um, she wasn't treated very well as a woman at Cambridge. In fact, in the 1920s in Cambridge, women could not receive their degrees. They could go to the lectures and they can take the exams, but they were not allowed to receive a degree. <laughs> it seems fairly disgraceful. And- um, Fairly disgraceful, you think? <laughs> yes, my, my aunt also, uh, she studied at Cambridge and couldn't receive her degree either. Wow. So, but- um, in the case of my aunt, she went to Dublin and they gave her a d degree based on her Cambridge exam results. Oh. In that Trinity that College Dublin. Trinity College Dublin. I, be, I went there once when I went to watch Wales yes. play rugby. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, Cecilia Payne uh, didn't get her degree, but she went to Harvard and the director of Harvard College Observatory, very famous astronomer called Harlow Shapley, he um, welcomed Cecilia and said, well, you can do a PhD here, even though she didn't have a, a bachelor's or master's. So Cecilia um, did um, a degree and she was got the first PhD in astronomy at Harvard, in fact. And Not the first for a, a woman, but the first for anyone. 
hers was a much lauded uh, PhD thesis. Well, some people wrote, this is the most brilliant PhD ever written in astronomy. Um, and it was published as a book. Um, and Cecilia published that in 1925, a book on stellar atmospheres. And the main result, the Harvard was doing a huge program on recording low resolution spectra of hundreds of thousands of stars in our Milky Way galaxy, of bright, the brighter stars, and classifying the spectra. But these uh, spectra, though not of very good quality, they uh, were enough to enable Cecilia to measure the strengths of the absorption lines caused by the different chemical elements in the outer layers of these stars. And by analyzing the strengths of those lines, you can estimate roughly the chemical composition of the stars. And Cecilia in her thesis came to the conclusion that essentially stars are made of hydrogen and helium, the two lightest elements, but practically nothing else. And the so-called expert on the composition of stars at that time was Henry Norris Russell, probably America's most famous astronomer in the 1920s, or in fact, the first half of the 20th century. And Russell poo-pooed this, stars um, aren't made of essentially uh, um, hydrogen and helium and nothing else. Um, but Cecilia said um, all the other elements which she had observed were a tiny, tiny, just a, um, a few percent of the, well, all combined, just a few percent of the total mass of any star. Russell said this is wrong, and Russell, who um, assessed uh, the thesis, uh, said, well, if you're going to publish this, um, my dear girl, you must say, I believe your results are spurious, and just say, I probably made a mistake. <laughs> then that was 1925. By 1929, Russell published a very well-known paper on the composition of the sun, where he came to the same conclusion four years later. And um, he mentioned in passing, oh, by the way, Cecilia Payne came to a similar result a few years ago. Just a <laughs> very brief mention. Really? So he retracted his criticism of Cecilia. And Cecilia was so disappointed with how Henry Norris Russell had treated her that she essentially, um, she went on working at Harvard College Observatory, but changed field entirely. And she worked, first of all, on the structure of the Milky Way and then on variable stars. So for the next uh, 50 years, she worked mainly on variable stars and became one of the world's great authorities. Variable stars, of course, are those which change their brightness over time for a variety of different reasons. So there are Not whole... Not for the first time, my goodness. Not for the first time, John. A, a tutor uh, steals the, the idea from a very clever woman and at, at the slightly later date puts it up as his own. Yes. That's Jocelyn, exactly Be right. Jocelyn Bell Burrell comes to mind. Yes. So a, a lot of very distinguished female astronomers have been um, downtrodden by men who probably have regretted their... Um, attacks on the women, and Alan Sandage against Beatrice Tinsley, Henry Norris Russell against um, Cecilia Payne, or as she later became known, Celia Payne Kapochkin, because she married a, a Russian astronomer, Sergei Kapochkin, in the early 30s. And um, what was the other one you just men mentioned? No, I, I, what I was going to say was that you actually, you met her, didn't you? Well, I did because um, she was still alive when I was at Harvard Smithsonian and I was there from 74 to 76. Cecilia Payne Goposchkin died in 79, I think it was, at the age of 79. So at one point, you and Beatrice Hill Tinsley, Tinsley and 
uh, Cecilia Payne Gapochkin were all on the same campus. Yes. So special moment. But of course, C Cecilia was actually working at Harvard, so I, I saw her often, but I, I was a bit shy and I didn't really make her acquaintance. But um, was she a bit, was she a bit sort of. Um, she looked a bit destitute. She was a chain smoker and when I was at, in the lifts. We sometimes rode up and down and lift together and she was begging away and she looked a bit haggard, actually. Oh, really? But I, I went to a, a seminar she gave on variable stars. She had a, a very good mind, very sharp mind. So it was amazing. You never took tea with her then? Well, at the Harvard seminars, everyone, probably a hundred people would astronomers would congregate in the seminar room, and drink tea together before the seminar started. So yeah, I probably had tea in the same room as Cecilia. Well, if I can just round this out, John, interestingly yes. enough, the last time uh, we talked, uh, you had mentioned your childhood in the Wirral, looking out at Moyle Vamai, <laughs> a mountain in North we America. never called it, we, we never pronounced it correctly, Gareth, for all these strange Welsh names. We called and, it Mole Fama. And then I chose to quote um, from uh, an Auden poem, Oh, Love of the Interest of Self in Thoughtless Heaven, in which Moyle Vama was mentioned. And after we finished, I did a little bit of research. And in fact, the line which I could not remember from that poem was, as children in Chester look to Moyle Vamai to decide on picnics by the clearness or withdrawal of her treeless crown. And the reason that I'm mentioning it now is that- Who wrote fact, that poem? Was it Dylan Thomas? W.H.O. Auden. Whistling oh, Auden. Auden. Yes. And here's the thing, here's the link where we've come right full circle, was that Beatrice Hill Tinsley was born in Chester. She was, yes. She uh, migrated to New Zealand, I'm not sure when, in the, in the 50s sometime, perhaps. Well, so. there's every chance was... that she, as a child, looked to Moyle Vamai to, de to decide with her parents whether to have a picnic, just as you had looked on Moyle Vamai in your childhood from the Wirral. There well, Chester's go. not that far from North Wales, is it? But I don't think there's a direct line of sight to that particular mountain, whose name I cannot pronounce, from Chester, well, but from is... the Wirral Peninsula there was. Well, there you go. But there's a spooky coincidence there. A yes. A spooky link between you and Beatrice and Cecilia. There you go. There is. So move, moving on from one spooky thing to another <laughs> spooky thing, um, we're... As we said the last time we talked, you have been to many interesting places. And the one I wanted to, to talk to you about um, lastly today is your visit to, of all places, Pitcairn Island. Tell us, please, John. Well, I went there twi twice, actually. Um, but the first time was, oh, was it 2019 or 18? I can't remember. Um, probably 18, anyway, a few years ago, quite quite recently. And um, it's a rather um, strange story, but as you may know, I've been active in the Araki Mackenzie Dark Sky Reserve. And the um, one of the members of the reserve board is also the accountant for Pitcairn Island. So uh, he told me about Pitcairn and he must have mentioned um, my existence to the Pitcairn Islanders because he went there every year, this person, Bruce Mincham, his name. And, he's, and he came back with the story that the Pitcairners are very interested in having um, an international dark sky sanctuary for and starting stargazing astrotourism. So that was the connection. And the tourism coordinator on Pitcairn, uh, a Pitcairner named Heather Menzies, um, 
sent me an email and said, would you like to come to Pitcairn and tell us about how to set up and apply for um, certification as an international dark sky place? Uh, and sure, I said, this sounds very interesting. I'll pop over. So um, getting to Pitcairn Island, it's about halfway between um, New Zealand and Peru in the South Pacific. So it's considerably further east of Tahiti. So to get to Pitcairn, you have to fly to uh, Tahiti and New Zealand will take you there. Then you um, fly from Tahiti on a small, um, is it called Air Tahiti or I think so, um, Tahiti plane. Tahiti Nui. Tahiti Nui, yeah. Could be. No, that, that's an island. Uh, anyway, you fly uh, from Tahiti to an island called Mangareva, in, um, still in French Polynesia, but it's a four hour flight going further east. Then you catch a boat, which leaves um, about once a week and it takes um, two nights, three days to get to Pitcairn from Mangareva. Not so, to be, not to be confused with Mangarea. Mangarea, Mangareva. So, Mangar it, it's quite near that island in French Polynesia where they did the nuclear tests. Ah, uh, in Mururoa. Mururoa, yes. So it's, it's probably a thousand kilometers east of Mururoa. Right. So, nearly all the islands in the South Pacific are in the western part, half of the South Pacific. Pitcairn Island is probably the last one as you go east. There's just um, Easter Island off the coast of Chile is the only other one. And so, so, so John, you, you work, oh my gosh, you work with, <laughs> I keep on pressing this thing and my seat falls down. Um, you worked with them and you managed to get them dark sky sanctuary status, is that right? Yes, so I, I gave them a course of lectures. There are 50 uh, residents at the time on Pitcairn Island and I said I'm going to give some talks about astronomy and astrotourism and stargazing and how telescopes work. So I gave a series of about four talks I think to at an audience of seven. <laughs> so that was you know it was about 20% um, of the population of wow. Pitcairn came Amazing. to my talk. By the way, Pitcairn is famous, um, well, as you know, it's um, the place where Fletcher Christian um, uh, started the mutiny of the bounty, but it's also famous because in 1838, I think, it's the first place in the world that gave women the vote. Wow. Did you know that? So everyone no, I did Zealand not know that. New Zealand was first. I but, know a lot of things, but not that. <laughs> yeah. So um, men and women on Pitcairn uh, have an equal vote, and they vote in the mayor. Wow, the, the mayor of Pitcairn. Yes. Wow. And so tell us, what was, what was the food like there? The food on Pitcairn is amazing, because though it's not in the tropics, it's very close to the tropics. So it's, it's an, essentially a tropical paradise. Everything just grows. The fruit is just abundant. Wow. Um, what it's about the dark skies? What were they like? Pretty good. And I had 11 days. This is February 2018. I remember now. So it was three years ago. Uh, oh, almost four now. Is it? Yeah. So um, we had several very good nights. And so we took a small telescope and binoculars up to the top of Pitcairn. And um, Probably we had seven or eight people doing stargazing over a couple of nights. That was fabulous. And we measured the how dark or bright the sky was, and it was incredibly dark. Um, so as, as dark as the best nights at Tekapo in New Zealand. Wow. So but there are only there are only three street, three or four street lights, and uh, Pitcairn is on a grid system powered by a diesel generator. 
that generator is turned off at 10 p.m. and switched on again at 6 a.m. every day. So there's absolutely no electricity or no light, except for candles on pit can, candles or torches, between 10, 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. So you can see that it's, it is going to be very, very dark. And the nearest habitation to pit can would be, um, well, there are a thousand people, people on Mangareva, which is a thousand kilometers away. And there are several thousand in Papieti and Tahiti. So it's one of the remotest places in the whole world, furthest from any center of population. So it's people that cause light pollution and skies to be bright. On Pitcairn, there are so few people and no, essentially no lights. So yeah, fabulously yeah. dark. There you go. So everybody listening in, if you like the night sky and you like tropical fruit and uh, you like to go to a place that was the first to give women the vote, then Pitcairn is the place to go. Absolutely. It's such a fascinating place. And the, do, when you go to Pitcairn, you, you have to stay with families. There are no hotels. Oh. Um, there is a prison there, but oh. the, it's probably the best building on Pitcairn is the prison. <laughs> Very comfortable. To last. But I stayed with a family and I had such a great time. Okay, well, thank you, John. Thanks for um, recounting your time on Pitcairn and your your um, your meetings with those famous women astronomers. I um, should mention that they did apply to the International Dark Sky Association to be an accredited dark sky place. They became a dark sky sanctuary in. I think it was March 2019, and I went back for a solar eclipse um, in the middle of 2019. It was raining, by the way, for the eclipse, but they had just received the accreditation from IDA, the International Dark Sky Association. So now they are a dark sky sanctuary, all ready to do astrotourism, but they haven't had any astrotourists because of COVID. So it's all been a bit of a <laughs> damp squid. There you, there you go, everyone. You can see that John is a big fan. So take, take his um, commendation for what it is. And when COVID comes to an end, get on that Tahiti Nui flight to Pap 80. And then the, uh, the next one to M Mangaray. Mangareva. Mangareva. Mangaray is where is Auckland Airport. That's right. So, so take that flight and then the boat, and it'll be a welcome waiting for you in, in Pit Adamstown, is it? Adamstown is the capital of Pitcairn. And as I say, everyone on Pitcairn lives in Ad Adamstown. Population okay. of Adamstown is probably about down to 45 now. I, I thought they might have named it Eve's Town once they gave women the vote, but there you go. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, John. Thank you. Um, Great to talk. Thanks, yeah, Gareth. It was wonderful to hear about your experiences um, knowing those famous people and uh, and going and going to a wonderful place. One of many you've been to, and hopefully we, you'll come back and talk to us again about the other wonderful places you've been to and the other wonderful pe people that you've met. Uh, we look it. forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks. Bye, Gareth. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take me to Callisto so I can see the stars. I want to view the Milky Way from a terraform base on Mars. From a terraform base on Mars. From a terraform base on Mars.